uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for a webinar entitled uh, Rehabbing and Repurposing Older Buildings. Uh, my name is Mike Goleman. I am a principal with Goleman and York uh, Property Advisors in East Hartford, Connecticut. I'm also the chair of the Greater Hartford Association of Realtors uh, Commercial Council. Uh, joining me today is Larry Dooley, who Larry is the managing uh, partner of Colt Gateway uh, in Hartford. And uh, this uh, topic of uh, rehabbing and repurposing older buildings as I, one I know that uh, many of the people listening today uh, can identify with and have some familiarity with. Uh, so let me uh, uh, in a second here, turn this over to Larry to get started. Uh, we're going to Larry has a PowerPoint that he's going to walk us through, and then we'll just chat a little bit about some of the challenges and, and uh, get Larry's uh, input and thoughts on uh, how he, he uh, got the project he's uh, doing off the ground and up and running. Uh, this is uh, one of a series of monthly uh, webinars that the Greater Hartford Association of Realtors Commercial Council has put together. Uh, we did the first one in December, this is the second. Uh, there will be one each month uh, through right now. Our schedule takes us through till uh, June. So uh, we hope you uh, stay tuned for the further announcements about upcoming topics. And, and of course, we hope uh, that you're able to uh, join us. So let me move, uh, let me move on and uh, welcome uh, Larry. Uh, glad you could join us today, Larry. And thank you for uh, taking an hour out of your day to uh, talk a little bit about this project. Well, thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. And uh, even with these unusual circumstances, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, anymore. <laughs> getting better. Yeah. So um, I, as you said, I'm the managing partner of Colt Gateway. Um, my investor partner is uh, Chevron TCI, who is a wholly owned subsidiary of Chevron Oil. And uh, I, I came here initially um, to run this and other projects for the first developer, which is a guy named Bob McFarlane and Homes for America Holding. And they came in here and took a swing at it and uh, they, they made some mistakes. And uh, I saw some of those mistakes. I was running construction. My background is in construction. And I, have a, I went to UConn for my undergrad. I have a master's in technology management. Um, and that's, uh, just something that's come in very handy here because of my now 40 years in construction. Uh, that does come in handy when you're doing something like this, working with a lot of contractors and a lot of maintenance and a lot of different things that require uh, that type of background. So uh, when I came here, uh, the original developer was doing fine and then uh, things uh, got out of hand and around 2008, I started in 2006. I'm actually about to have my 15 year anniversary from the day I walked in the door here. Uh, had a lot more hair back then, uh, but you know, uh, <laughs> we, we got there. So uh, I came in and was working for him and he ultimately made me executive director of the project uh, for him. But then it started going south in 2008, as, as many of you know, that was a tough year for a lot of developers. And so he handed it over to another developer for a short period, that didn't work out. And in 2010, Chevron called me up and said, uh, look, we're gonna, we're the tax credit investor now. Uh, we're gonna exercise our rights. We're gonna take over the project if you'll come in as the managing uh, partner and partner up with us. And uh, so I pretended like I, I didn't know I was gonna say yes immediately. I, uh, I, I said I had to go ask my wife actually, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I was very excited about that opportunity. And since then in 2010, I've uh, just tried to make the most of that opportunity and try to continue to create value here. That's great, thank you. It's a terrific project as uh, uh, many people may uh, uh, also have shared. Uh, I was able to uh, see a lot of the project and Larry was kind enough to give us a, a guided tour a, a while back now. And it's really a remarkable, it's a remarkable site and set of buildings, uh, but perhaps most importantly, it's a remarkable outcome that uh, Larry and his team have uh, managed to bring. So. Talk a little bit about the, just to give the audience a, a sense of how big it is, how many square feet and, and how big is the site? Sure, we have um, about 600,000 square feet um, and we've got 10 buildings. And you'll see when we get to the PowerPoint, there's uh, some maps and things that kind of show what buildings we have. 
Um, we have 177 residential apartments now. Uh, we have, gosh, about 300,000 square feet of a commercial and educational space uh, between um, Insurity and uh, JCJ. We have three architects, JCJ, Merit Design, Tecton, and some of that's in my PowerPoint we can go over, but uh, we also have Correct School as a huge presence here, and they've been a big part of this place. And then they've receded back since. So it's, it's funny because historic projects are all about adaptive reuse, but sometimes it's the second time. Um, so sometimes you're on the second adaptive reuse. So uh, these are some photos. That, that photo in the center is a, a photo I took off the roof of the South Armory. Uh, that's how it looks from the South Armory. That's what I'm looking out my window right now. It's where my office is. Uh, the building to the right is the East Armory, the iconic East Armory. And those are some photos that Taisu Kim took after they, they did the design on that building on the exterior. And the building to the left is our South Armory. And that's that's our largest building that we have here. Nope, try not to go too fast So, so some of these things are, uh, you know, you go to the next slide, it's about adaptive reuse. This was some, uh, some photos that uh, JCJ actually put together for me uh, and kind of put this verbiage together here, but it was showing some of their space and how they adaptively reuse. They're in that East Armory, uh, our most iconic building. And, but they put some of the, you know, older stuff, the broken windows and stuff for the kind of cool artistic feel. So uh, my job is to make all that broken stuff go away. Yeah, looks well, great. I've been in their office. This just shows you some of the history of this place. So uh, you look at the, to the left, this was a strike at the upper uh, corner that they had at the coal factory. Uh, that building right in front of them, you see the brownstone up in the far left uh, corner. That's the one that we're donating. We're in the process of donating to the Park Service because we now are a national uh, historical park. And they're not gonna be established as a park until they actually were actually able to donate the buildings. I'll say one of the toughest things I've ever done at Cole is try to donate two buildings to the federal government. Very difficult <laughs> um, and donate. Um, and then you look to the photo to the right, you see some of the workers and this is in the mill in the East Armory, which you'll see some interior photos. That's where you've got JCJ Architects, you've got Senator Murphy has his office there. Uh, we have some CREC programs there. Uh, Insurity has some space there as well. Uh, look at the lower corner. Uh, that's some construction they did, which is our what we call our L-shaped building, uh, where you can see the wood framing up. And that was like a community center for cold at the time. And that was a CREC school for quite a while. And we now brought, brought Tecton Architects into that building on the second floor. And the first floor, uh, we're gonna do a second adaptive reuse at it as well. And we're working on the plans for that. And some of the others, you have a lithograph at the bottom and, and a historic photo of the whole project. So here's the map of our 600,000 square feet. And you can see, um, well, some people would say it's good and some people would say it's bad. Most developers would say it's good that we have a lot of parking. Um, so we, we do have a lot of parking and that one, that one parking lot uh, that's kind of blocked off way down to the right and actually those buildings to the far right, that's where Dillon Stadium is. So that's been a great uh, asset to our neighborhood is now they've, they've fixed that up with Hartford Athletic over there. Uh, so those two little buildings you can see just to the right of Masique Street are two little buildings that are on the stadium grounds. Uh, but everything to the left of that is, is Colt Gateway. And the one building that looks the largest starting from the right, that's a sawtooth building and Insurity has about 62,000 feet there. And we have in the back space, Crec has Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts. We have dance studios in there, it's beautiful. Um, the building next to that to the left is our South Armory. And that's uh, got 129 apartments in it. And we've got Foley Carrier Services in that, some more Crec School in that. And uh, down where you can see a patio kind of down at the bottom of that building, that's where the Hooker uh, Brewery is, the Hooker Cafe is and, and that patio there. And that's kind of an interesting story that we have a school in the building and we have a cafe, cafe in the building, but that's something that Crec does such a great job and we separated the things and we made it so it could, they, the paths could never cross. And that's just some of the, you know, when you talk about agenda and development, that's when you have to get Crec to write a letter to ask you to be able to put a pretty much what's a bar and a, and, and a brewery in next to a school. But believe it or not, they were 100% supportive of it. We've never had a problem with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, going up to where the dome is, you can see the blue, that's the East Armory. That's where we have JCJ Architects. So we have um, 
Senator Murphy's office. That's where we have some correct space there as well. Uh, we have insurity has some back office space there too. Uh, and uh, we're actually working on some plans for the first floor, which is still vacant space. Just below that is the North Armory. That's the one I, uh, you'll see pictures in in the future here uh, that, that uh, we just finished. That's 48 uh, more uh, market rate apartments that we fully leased. They came online April 1st, 2020. Kind of a rough time to come online. Yeah. Uh, and we we leased all 48 of them out by uh, mid uh, August of 2020. So wow. and that's kudos to my leasing person. Uh, Clarissa does such an amazing job uh, leasing these apartments, all the way that she markets and does a lot of social media stuff. And she's going to do some videos about some apartments that we're going to be doing shortly. We're actually about to start another apartment project over in uh, what's the U-shaped building, and it's that name for obvious reasons. That U-shaped building on the left uh, at the top, uh, that's about 45,000 square feet, three-story building. Crec was in there. They lost a lot of bonding money. They left the whole building. Uh, so I went about to the second adaptive reuse again, and we, we were able to put a credit union, uh, Hartford Healthcare, now the wellness credit union on the first floor. Uh, we're now, we just signed a, a lease with uh, a fitness club called Get In, Get Fit, which we're putting on the first floor as well. And then we're going to put 28 more market rent apartments. We actually have just pulled the permits for that. And we're expecting to start construction on that in two weeks. Um, so that's kind of interesting to be doing now. But um, And that's also, uh, when we get into the financing, that's done with a second with CRDA. So we have a second mortgage with CRDA on that. We did that with the North Armory too. And they've been instrumental in bringing housing to Hartford and to all the neighborhoods that want it. Um, then down in the in the corner at the bottom left, you've got uh, what's the L-shaped building and what's noted as the gym. But that was an old uh, that was old. Um, the names for that were there from when that was a correct building. Uh, that building is a gorgeous building that says gym on it and is now. Um, uh, part of a company that's green boxes. It's one of their offices. It's a showroom. It's an amazing, amazing one story space. It is just gorgeous. Uh, they are a great company and anybody who's looking at office space or using some of their systems that they have, it, it's incredible. It's just the most beautiful office fit outs I've really seen. It's just, it's gorgeous. Um, then we've got our boiler house. It's functional still. We've got 12 boilers, three cooling towers there. And we've got the, what's the actual L-shaped building proper at the bottom. And that's one that was a correct school as well. They vacated, I put Tech Town on the second floor and we've got Mayor Design on the second floor and we're working on the first, first floor right now to do some co-live, co-work space. That's really remarkable. So can you break it down for the audience? Like how many residential units in total do you have? We have 177 right now and then we're gonna add uh, 28 uh, units to that. Uh, right. Once we do the U-shaped building and we complete and, that, and so the one seventy, the one seventy-seven that are that are already done, they're fully leased or ninety-five percent leased. We, we we hit nine. We hit there's so when you go to residential, um, which I was surprised about when I found out a lot of things being here. <laughs> so residential, what I found was the average turnover for apartments nationally and even in Hartford, I believe, is about fifty percent. So if you're going to have 100 and say 100 apartments, to make the math easy for me, 50 of them are going to theoretically leave after the first year, regardless. Mm -hmm. Our turnover rates about 39%, which I was upset about that until I found out that was actually very low. So we're always turning apartments, but we actually last year hit 95% for real, even with all that turn. Wow. So that was a really amazing feat. Again, uh, kudos to our leasing department. They just do such an amazing job. Uh, leasing apartments. Also, there's a couple things I think that have been good about it. I don't want to, you know, I'll, I'll do as much about the COVID as you want, but w one of the things about it has been that it it put a ripple through this uh, apartment markets right now in that, and I made a change based on it when I laid out my U-shape apartments. I actually changed uh, the course of the layouts based on what I saw. And what I saw was that there was a model that was happening pre-COVID that was a smaller apartment with a huge uh, kind of amenity areas and all that. So you can imagine in the short term, the impact on this because amenity rooms are closed, can't use them. Now people are 
really in their apartment. And so there's a greater concern as to what is this layout inside the apartment as opposed to what's outside the apartment. Right. So now you have this um, thing where one bedrooms and one thing I've added are dens. So you can do a studio with a den. It gives you that second little Zoom room, I'll call it. It's mm -hmm. These are the things that people are looking for now. I think with our co-live, co-work space, we're gonna give people less expensive studio apartments with, but the studio to me went a little bit out of favor and trying to at least get a studio with a den or something. And I did make adjustments on U-Shape. I only have one studio in the whole building. Wow. Uh, they're all, but I, I didn't go to crazy large apartments. I just put like either a studio with a den or one bedroom with a den and kind of left it in the middle. And that seems to be the most popular apartment. Yeah, um, any of the studios that we've seen in modern designs all, all seem to now have some sort of, at a minimum, they've got an alcove where there's an area for a Zoom area, you know, exactly. uh, or, so or that's, work that's from home area. It's an important thing to consider. Right. Look, the, the bottom line is the reg, the apartment mix that's always been historically the apartment mix. A couple of studios, mostly one bedrooms, a couple of two bedrooms. That's kind of when you're, you know, when you're in, depends on your demographics, but for our mm -hmm. demographics where we do have younger, I tend to have younger people or empty nester people, that, that demographic, that works. But it used to be more studios. Now I think we're definitely going to less studios than more. And I think that's gonna be a trend you will see. Like you said, you're gonna minimally be partitions up inside right. these studios to create some dense space. So 177 apartments and, and what about square footage of commercial space for the architects and some of the other uh, uses that you mentioned? Sure, so if you go back to the buildings on the Sawtooth building, we got 62, actually in surety between the Sawtooth building and the East Army, they've got 75,000 square feet. And that's, and they've been, they've had to work from home for months and months and months now. So one can't help but to wonder the impacts of these things. And mm -hmm. it's been pretty quiet, but you know, it's something it's to be, to continue to watch. Um, everybody has been more than reasonable, all our tenants. And I'll tell you, as far as percentages of tenants, we haven't seen one bit of change in payables. So everybody mm -hmm. is, it's been amazing. Oh, I got to knock on that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's great to but be able to But it's been so that. far, and I am, I am concerned about the years to come because mm -hmm. there's going to be impacts on the market and we don't understand yet. So, yeah. so we have to always be uh, cognizant of that. But I, I think right now I'm looking at it as being very positive that we made it to this point and, and really whole and really in good shape with all our tenants. So now it's a matter of, are they going to come back? How are they going to come back? what changes are gonna happen on the commercial side. The U-shaped building in the upper left-hand corner that I converted from what, that was originally Colt's office building. So that was primed to be office building. It was, that's what it was. And even when we used it as a school, as a first adaptive reuse, when they left, it was still really primed to be an office building. I don't know, and it, I'd like to say it was genius, it was not. Somehow I just went over there and I knew about the CRDA program. And I said, you know, this could really make beautiful apartments. We do so well with our rentals and we're diversifying a little bit more away from commercial because we have a lot of commercial space. So I did make the change, went to Hartford, I had to go through the PNZ, change the use and all of this, but I did change the use to residential on that, a mixed use, but residential on the upper floors on that building. And that okay. was a change, but that was not COVID related. I did that in early 19. I just thought for, for us, it was good. It turned out to be, uh, a good thing, uh, but apartment rents and how they fare in the future remain to be seen. So far, it's been okay, but we'll see. The good thing about apartments is it's easier to adjust things. It's easier and you're looking at a lot of different leases. So it just, it's almost like playing the market a little bit. You're very diversified at that. Sometimes when you put your eggs in one basket with the tenants. So going back to occupancy and square footage, 75,000 for insurity, Gosh, Creck still has over 100,000 square feet in the back of the Sawtooth building, in that South Armory building, and some in the East Armory. They are actually building a middle school in Bloomfield, so they're going to move some of their middle schoolers out of here. And at the end of the day, we're just going to have an adult education program they have here with about 15,000 feet, and they're probably going to have probably about 50 to 60,000 square feet that they're gonna have for the Greater Hartford Academy of Arts High School that will continue to operate partially here and partially up at the learning corridor by Trinity. And that's something they did temporarily. 
And with their loss of bonding money, they've decided to keep it here. So that will remain. The two brownstones you see, they're, they're uh, shown as um, uh, building eight and 10 in the middle, those two brownstones. Those buildings are the ones we're gonna donate. They're about 9,000 square feet apiece. We're gonna do donate those to the National Park Service. We're hoping that's gonna be done by mid year this year. And then they have some stabilization money because those buildings are, well, I always just call them a pile of rocks because they are, they're just a pile of brownstones with a slate roof. So they could be beautiful, but they're gonna take a lot of work. National Park Service will take those two buildings, make a visitor center, exhibition center, what they do with that. North Armory is all residential. First floor, I uh, can't divulge it yet, but where you see where it says maintenance shop, that's no longer gonna be a maintenance shop. It really hasn't been for years, but that's just above the North Armory there, uh, kind of towards the center. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be a pretty interesting event space. I can say that some company is making an interesting investment into that space in a really a time that it really takes a lot of guts to make an investment like that but we've kind of started that process and that is going to be uh, announced pretty soon so that's going to be pretty interesting and that's going to tie in nicely with the get in get fit group which is out of bloomfield now this fitness group but they work with teams and everything else is going to be in u-shape so then the u-shape will be the other 28 apartments the credit union is about 10,000 feet l-shape we've got uh, tecton about 14,000. We've got about 5,000 square feet with uh, green boxes. And then we've got Mare Design with I think about three to 4,000. And then the first floor of that building is about 22,000 square feet. And that's still vacant. And that's the one I wanna work on the co-live, co-work, but uh, you know, I'm working on, on my bank. Mm -hmm. on that. Wow, that's a great story. It's, it's an amazing project. Well, I'm gonna move on and you can kind of talk us through a little bit. Uh, that's the aerial of the same plan, yeah, Same right? thing, yep. Yeah. There's the historic picture of actually those were in some exhibition, the things they had out there. One was like a Gatling gun and one was some other kind of device. I don't even know what some of those were, but this was some of the crew. And actually, this is an interesting picture. I believe it's from 18. I think this is the one that's from 1876. And uh, if you look where this photo is kind of split there um, and you look uh, in the second floor, what looks to be, it's actually the third floor, but the second floor window, you see these guys sitting yeah. in the window there. And you look at that window around the corner, it looks like there's a ghost in there. We've got the picture that's bigger, but there's a ghost <laughs> in this picture that's pretty interesting. Uh, we don't know what the heck it is. No one knows what the heck it is because these guys that are in sitting outside of that corner window on the second floor would be right next to what appears to be. So we don't know what that is, but it appears to be a ghost. Okay. I, somehow, I don't think OSHA would let the, the company have its employees hanging out the second floor window sitting in <laughs> anymore. Yeah, can you imagine this was a factory that made firearms and yeah. they had guys climbing <laughs> light poles and actually to the right, there's all the, that was the old office building to the right, that's the Italian aid house. And right. you see all the office guys are standing up on top of that with their, you know, foot up on the, on yeah. the rail up there and they have, they have numbers over their names, one, two, three, and four. So. They were there. You fall out at your own fault. <laughs> That's right. That's great. So there here's what it looks zone. like now. Um, Taisu photoshopped the ugly fence that we have around the bottom. Uh, they photoshopped that out, but the rest of it is real. And uh, actually, there's some monies uh, that have been set aside for quite some time for the streetscape work on that street. So they're going to put a brand new fence across there, and they're going to put a new sidewalk and new lights and really do what we should be doing with a national treasure. That's the These were the picture. historic pictures I already went through yeah. those. That's just a picture of uh, JCJ. This reminds me of all my tenants, so I don't forget one. So yeah. this is JCJ's common area space, which is in that East Armory. Uh, these are the tenants in the East Armory. This is their space. They have about 18,000 feet. And, and it's just gorgeous. I mean, the pictures don't even do it justice. It's gorgeous. Is it correct that the stairway we can see actually goes up to the bottom of the dome there? Is that where the dome is? That's, that's, that goes up, yeah, it goes up to the attic. We have it closed off now because the stairs aren't uh, recommended because uh, we have another access way. But yes, that actually does go right up to the dome. Uh, yeah. It goes up to a staircase in the attic that then goes to the staircase to the dome. Right. There's a before and after of the uh, really what was the back side of the building. It's kind of become the front side because our courtyard's on the, on mm -hmm. the uh, west side rather than the east, but you could see the state of the building and the windows and everything else when we started. Yeah. Oh, 
Sorry. That's all right. A little sensitive that's, here. That's our, <laughs> that's our, you just blew right by 10 million bucks. Yeah. So right. that's, that's our uh, U-shaped building. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the before and after. We took the plywood off. We found out why there was plywood on the windows because there weren't any windows. Uh, so we went about uh, to make that the initial, like I mentioned, a second adaptive reuse. So this was the first adaptive reuse in 2013. Uh, the picture to the right was when we made it into the Crack School. And it was this uh, an environmental high school, a two river school for Crack that they ultimately merged with another high school that they already had uh, built in um, uh, Weathersfield, I believe. Uh, but they moved out of that that building in 2018. And that left me with an empty building and that's where we went to the apartments and the credit union. This is the one that we just finished. Uh, believe it or not, those are all occupied apartments now, uh, but that was while we were in the throes of demolition once we took all the, so that's our North Armory. You can see it's right next to the renovated East Armory to the left. Uh, that that North Armory, we, we really put that thing right down to the shell as you can see and, and put it all back together. And that building out to the far right, the lower building, is one of the buildings that you're donating to the Park Service. Is that right? That's correct. That's yeah, the okay. brown, one of the brownstones. Yes. This is our South Armory. It's just one elevation of it. It's a it's a very that's the largest building, about two hundred thousand feet. That's a little before and after the same. That's one where we have the 129 apartments in the upper four floors, uh, and then we have uh, fully carrier services on the second floor, half of it. The other half is part of the correct school. And then the first floor has that patio with the Hooker Brewery. We have a little cafe down there. And then um, we have a, an office that we have, a fitness center in there. And then on the other side, it's closed off and it becomes the correct school again on the far end of the building. There's our tenants for the South Armory, uh, our apartments, Thomas Hooker Brewery, Foley and correct school. These are our South Army apartments that we did in 2015. Uh, and those are always stay very occupied. Like yeah, I said, 95% right. range. Yeah, look right. So uh, while we're doing this, talk about the little bit about the rents. If you, on, on the apartments, for example, uh, what are you seeing on the apartments on a per square foot basis? So, um, when we originally did the South Armory back in 15, um, we knew we had to undercut downtown uh, pricing wise. So, and I was looking at downtown markets were about two bucks on the apartment scale on the month scale. Mm -hmm. So two bucks, uh, 24 bucks a foot. That was kind of what they were looking at. So we came in probably gosh, at about a buck 65, I'd say we, we might even have started out because we started out, we had some apartments that were done about 40 from the first developer and we finished a few more than we finished all of them. So in 2015, the numbers we were trying to hit was probably about a buck 65. Um, and then that slowly went up with escalations and over time, because that was 15. So we've escalated. Uh, we usually escalate one to 2% a year on average, depending on the year and what's going on. This will be interesting what's going on in the future. And I've actually uh, just... Uh, held all escalations for the last at least three months. So I've locked down, I haven't escalated anybody's renewals and locked because I'm just watching. Yeah. Uh, then on the North Armory, when I built those out and I presented the Performa to the bank and the CRDA, um, I was showing as an average rent, you know, studios being much higher, it was two bedrooms being much lower on a square footage basis. The average rents uh, really would be um, about two bucks. So I went for the two bucks there because now I saw downtown had gone up to, gosh, some of these we were looking at two, 220, 240. Um, and when I talked to Mike Freeman, who's the executive director of CRDA, he's very knowledgeable about the product. And you know, initially it said, you know, maybe us being within the 10 to 20% range of the nicest product downtown. Uh, now we're probably neck and neck with them, I'd say. And, and, and as a comp would be CIL, who did the Capewell building down the street, really close to us, very comparable product. Um, and they are also seem to be uh, in between what we're doing here in the South and there at the North. So I'm gonna be watching very closely as I ultimately set the prices 
for these 28 coming online mm -hmm. and continuing to set prices as we get that 39% turnover that I mentioned. JCJ's offices are beautiful. I've been in there. The columns are, uh, those steel columns are beautiful. They, you know what's uh, interesting about that was that everybody else here has always painted those steel. See, these are white. That's in Shuri space. Everybody here has always painted everything white. And then, of course, you know, you get a good architect comes in and they're like, it's their space. And they said they were going to paint the columns black. And I said, really? Wow, that's okay. And then they said they were going to use whitewash on the exterior walls. Interesting story there was the National Park usually won't allow it because you're supposed to paint the exterior walls because that's historically what was. They don't want anyone to go sandblasting the brick and destroy its integrity. So they'd rather have you just take the loose and flaky off and then paint over. You know, that's what that's their preference. Mm -hmm colors they want to see kind of more traditional colors but what you know jcj smart architects they said okay we're going to take all the pigment out except 15 percent, but it's still latex paint still the same properties so they're able to create a whitewash effect while still applying a normal latex breathable paint that the park service demands and not destroying the integrity of the brick very smart and then you put the black with that it just looks gorgeous yeah it looks great So that's in Surety's back yes, office. There's the white columns space. you were talking about. Yeah. And they, yeah, they painted their columns white. And they did more of a traditional, and, you know, they hosed it all down white because they thought that's what they had to do. And then they went up and looked at JCJ's space. And, I, you know, I, I didn't know about the pigment part, you know. Um, yeah. So I think they would have actually enjoyed to have that. So we'll, we'll see. It's, it's kind of tough now, but mostly the Park Service, the National Park Service, and this goes to tax credits when we start talking about the money parts, they want to see the brick painting, honestly. Yeah, looks good though. I mean, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. So there's some. So here's the tenants. tenants that we have. Yeah, you know, I already mentioned those a few times before. before and after. after. That's more JCJ's. That's that's some of the progress. So so this was kind of interesting. The way the building was built it was built with wrought iron steel. It was one of the first steel structures ever built because almost every mill of this period was built with timber frames. But because this mill was burned down during the Civil War, after Sam Colt died, Elizabeth Colt put insurance on it. Then it was burned down during the Civil War a couple of years later. She collects the insurance policy. She decides she's going to rebuild the East Armory as a fireproof, fireproof building. And she builds it out of it in this methodology that you see a lot in Europe, but it's wrought iron steel beams with brick that's kind of arched between them that makes up your ceiling. It makes for a gorgeous ceiling. Yeah. And then we just put, we took all the old wood that was off the top because it was all, you know, they had number two oil for machines and stuff. Took it all off, cleaned everything up and put a new simple two by six structures on top on edge and then put plywood over the top of it, done. Mm -hmm. yeah, very effective. The ceilings are beautiful in the building. They really are. So there's Insurity. They were the first anchor tenant here. They actually, I've been here 15 years. They've been here 16 years. So they've been here, they vested in this place very early and we're gonna do everything we can to keep them happy as a tenant. They're a yeah. great tenant, great. That's great. Correct. Green, look at this. And this doesn't even do it justice, just gorgeous. They just, their, their stuff is so beautiful. They have these different systems that they that they have and it's just, they do some really nice stuff, really yeah, nice. Cool. Tecton, Tecton that's not their space. Their space is also beautiful, but unfortunately they finished their space right before all this stuff happened and we weren't in, able to get in and get pictures. And so we'll get there, but their space in the L shape, that was something from, I think their original space, their space now is all wide open. It's, it's, it, it really does. It's, it's, it's another gorgeous space. Have an architect design their own space. And you'll get the best space ever. Yeah. yeah well that. <laughs> <laughs> you can afford it. Mayor Designs also with us. They're they're in the uh, L shaped building as well, and they do a lot of work for us as well. Here's our North Armory that we've yeah. converted to apartments and rented out. So you see, it was in pretty rough shape to begin with. There's one of the apartments. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful views too. Oh, the views are just unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a uh, one of a kind view with the dome. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's the appeal to this place. It's unique. And that's one thing we'll always have. 
Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. not always unique in the most wonderful ways, but 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 it's unique. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's always different and unique. And a lot of people come. We get people from all over that fall in love with it, just looking at the pictures online. Honestly. Yeah, I'll bet. So here's the newest project. This was what was Craig School. Uh, this looks like a two-story building, but it's actually three from the backside. Uh, these two stories right now are what I'm converting into an apartment with a dream of a rooftop deck up there on the right, but we'll see. Um, but that that building is, and, and you'll see the next couple of slides, will show you uh, just a couple of quick layouts, I think. Well, the Wellness Federal Credit And that's what we, th those were our permit drawings that we put into Hartford. Okay. Close to approval for that. But you see, one of the things actually, if you look at that last, any one of those apartments, because they're stacked, but if you open that one up, that you see where uh, right in the center of the U, there's apartments that kind of come back in and the hallway goes around them. Uh, and it's all right, but I basically took two studios and turned them into dens off of the one, off of the, off of the other apartments instead of, that's where I did that kind of conversion to break from the studio and go more to the den. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, beautiful. Thank You've you. done a remarkable job. Thank you very much. Really astounding. So, can can you share with the audience a little bit about the investment side? You know, as you know, we uh, here at Goldman New York we do a lot of work on the advisory side and conversion and rehabbing and repurposing of older buildings is a popular subject uh, throughout the Northeast. Really, we spend a lot of our time looking at these buildings. And the challenge is always a financial one, you know, uh, the cost of uh, repurposing or rehabbing these buildings often exceeds uh, the cost of new construction. And uh, sometimes the rents just doesn't, don't, just don't get you there. So talk a little bit about, you know, your experience with Cold Gateway. How, how did, you mentioned Chevron and you might want to talk a little bit about that to the degree you can share information about that structure. Oh, of course. So, um, when I came in, I mentioned that, you know, they brought me in as managing partner. They were, they were in, a, in a rough position because they had invested on quite a few federal historic tax credits. So part of what creates a foundation, a financial foundation for these places are, it's, it's gonna be uh, what you mentioned is the rents are never gonna get you there. So when you get to your net operating income point and based on some cap rate, that's gonna get you your valuation. That is just not gonna work for the amount of money you're gonna to need to borrow and put into these buildings, this is not gonna work. So you start out with your foundation of your tax credits. Um, so you, you would have your federal historic tax credits, which are a heavier lift, and they've actually been devalued in the, in the new uh, tax laws that came out in actually 17. Uh, they somewhat devalued the historic tax credits because they didn't allow the purchaser to take them immediately upon substantial completion of the project, they made them prorate them out so they could only receive the credits over a five-year period as opposed to receiving all the credits initially and then being subject to recapture on a percentage basis over five years. They changed the rules to say, you can put your capital contribution in, but you can only get your credits over this five-year period, which obviously devalues them. So um, this was something that's been changed that I am hopeful will change back. So you start with that, that has to be a certain size deal to do federal tax credits because the cost of entering into these agreements is pretty extensive. Yeah, and yeah. you uh, gonna have to pull in somebody who's got that kind of tax burden like Chevron, or used to have, <laughs> I don't know anymore. But when you look at Chevron, uh, that kind of company, PPG, other big companies that buy credits, uh, these you have to and now you have to do a pass through agreement and they become the master tenant and it's very complicated you need specialized attorneys uh, specialized accountants and sometimes others it depends on your knowledge from as a developer and you need consultants ultimately to put all your applications in guys like you to to help explain the deal and help people figure the deal out even with these building blocks right so you got mm -hmm. your federal credits so you put that deal together the state credits are a much simpler deal. They're a five part application, a little bit of a tough thing there, but the, the program is transferable. So you can sell these to any Connecticut company. So Chevron couldn't take those credits because they're not allowed to do business in Connecticut. 
So therefore, those are credits where I would have to sell to a third party. Now, we have done this with insurance companies in the past, but most recently, Eversource has a program where if you're in an opportunity zone, or whatever the new designation will be, that you, uh, they'll buy, they'll potentially buy the credits at par. Mm -hmm. So can't beat that deal. No. So really. that's something we've done with them. That's what I'm trying to do with our North Arm. I've earned a lot of credits on the North Armory for our company. And now I'm looking at that going to Eversource to those uh, and work with them on the purchase of those credits. So that's an easier deal. You don't need the high level there. So if you were doing a smaller project, you could still do the state credits and not do the federal. That's what mm -hmm. I would suggest. It's still not going to get you there, unfortunately. Some of the things I did here was, and it was a different world, remember, uh, 15, well, not even 15, call it even 10 years ago. So even 10 years ago, you know, I was going to DECD and I was able to work out different grants, uh, worked out a grant with the city of Hartford. I mean, can you imagine the city of Hartford really doing a grant? or a project like this right now, it's probably not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So they did a grant, but you know what? It was a guy named uh, Panagor that was there. Best thing they ever did, because our taxes are now $1.4 million a year. They gave us a $5 million grant to keep this thing rolling. We put it into building out these apartments. We earned income, they jacked our taxes up and we pay taxes through the nose now, which is painful, but it got us to where we needed to be to get the apartments done, turned out to be they were probably my best investor because that money that they put in, what they're paying a pittance on in, and, and actually they, they gave off to the state, honestly, but that bond that they took to do that grant, I mean, compared to what they're earning back in taxes, when I took over this project, there were 800,000 in the rears on taxes. I think it went up to 1.5 and the tax was 200,000. Now it's yeah. 1.4. So say again, so just so we're clear here, the audience is clear. So there's a $5 million grant and you're paying 1.4 million in taxes? Yeah. I'll do that all day long. There will be a lot of us out there would say, I'll, I'll invest in that, you know? <laughs> now you got to remember we had some tax base to begin with about sure. 200,000. Um, oh. And, you know, we might've gotten there anyway, or they might've been, but I'll tell you that, just that thing was what kept Chevron in the game. Mm -hmm. because initially they were just trying to save the credits and then this kept them in the game because they went oh gosh i'm not going to walk away from this i'll make the investment to make this work because i'd be a fool not to so yeah. they decided to do to stay in and then all of a sudden i talked to this was when malloy was governor talked to him he did a grant for the east arm because it was such a historic building we we're trying to do the park service so that pulled in more that allowed me to borrow money from what was United Bank, now People's United Bank, uh, to, to, to now get a lender on board and let Chevron step down in the equity position and stop dumping money. Yeah, so what, what do you think the total investment uh, is today? What, what's, the, what's gone into it so far today? Is that an easy number to come up with? I realize it's fairly It's not that hard. I mean, you know, it's, I would say it's in the $120 million range yeah. So when you look at that, it's like, what the, how the heck did that happen? Yeah. Well, there was a lot of deleveraging back in 2008 of bank loans. There was a lot of things that happened when Chevron came in as my, my partner and my big brother, if you will, in 2008, a lot of the, a lot of people were in really kind of panic mode as some people are now. And, you know, they were in panic mode and they were willing to get me out, give me something, get me out. So with Chevron there, knowing that there was real funds there, mm -hmm. that it allowed us to deleverage this place. If we had never been able to deleverage the place, it just never would have happened. Never. Really? They would have, whoever took the deal took a great deal because they would have lost everything, honestly. So, you know, we that's what we did. So, I mean, I rolled my sleeves up and was in the middle of all those really fun uh, negotiations. But... Uh, they weren't that bad because the time was of 2008 and that was also a really crazy mm -hmm. kind of horrible time between 2008 and 10. This is when this all happened. You know, you've been in the business too long when your experience spans a number of recessionary periods, you know, <laughs> and I, I find myself saying it was, it, I think it was four recessions ago when this happened, you know, so a couple, a couple of questions and comments from the audience. One comment is that the grandfather worked there and this is awesome. So that ought to make you feel good. That, you know? I hear that quite a bit of people. Oh, 
grandfathers, things like that. It's so cool. And a lot of times if people show up and they tell me somebody, I'll, I'll take them, see what they want. I mean, I, I love it when people come here with stories like that. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. I'll bet. I'll bet. A uh, question was, uh, uh, will any of the rentals be available for purchase? And I assume that's obviously referring to the apartments. Do you think you'll ever convert or do a condo uh, or co-op arrangement in any of these buildings? I don't, at the moment, I don't think the market's quite here yet, but I mm -hmm. do hear some murmurings that this kind of thing could be possible. When you look at it, so when you look at it from a rent perspective of $1,600 average rent for a one bedroom apartment, so now put a cap rate to that minus the expenses, what's it worth? And sometimes when you look at this, the apartments might be worth so much money based on that valuation that it might not be feasible that people are going to pay that kind of money when they right. could almost get a house, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question about the environmental remediation. Uh, can you share sort of an estimate of what uh, uh, what you've spent on environmental remediation work overall? That one I don't even want to know. But <laughs> it's 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 north of five million, and 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 it's it's well north of that, and it could be even approaching ten. But I. I don't, I haven't calculated the actual number. I'm actually going to go and do a little forensic yeah. searching and, and find out exactly what that number was. Because the previous developer did quite a bit and that's documented. So right. I'd have to so add that's that not to in your number. number. What they spent is not in your five to 10 million? No, I'd say, yeah, we're talking about what it took. So I'm still working off the same remedial action plan. Okay. We have uh, documented with the DEP and the EPA. Mm -hmm. So, and it's funny that that question was asked because we just finished red letter day was last Monday and we just finished our all the remedial action plan work, including capping and everything. So now we just have to do the final report, which is going to be more expensive than I want it to be, but mm -hmm. we're done in the ground, which that was a really, so, so the, the remedial action report started in 2003. So I'm working off a 2003 remedial action report. And I just finished all that work. Wow. Wow. I'd say that's a career for a lot of people just doing that. It has been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, again, uh, a question about financial assistance from federal or state. Uh, and I, I think you sort of touched on that a little bit, but what, what, was there direct federal or state involvement? You mentioned the grant money from Hartford. Sure. Uh, so we got, we got a, a grant money. We got grant monies from an assistance agreement with the city of Hartford back in like 13 and 14. Um, I think that's when it was. And then we've got a grant, which was an assistance agreement with DECD uh, to do the East Army. That was back in 15, 16. Um, and then we've had, they had a manufacturer's assistance uh, uh, grant program that I don't think is in existence anymore. And we were able to get a couple of those that were like 500,000 for front of the, some of the tenant improvement for like fully carrier services and things like that. Um, and well, actually the, the, the federal, the, the historic tax program is a federal grant. Is right, federal. right. Yeah. State program has been a lot of money for us and that's brought in a ton of money here. Uh, but DECD, like I said, they did a lot. And with a previous developer, they did like a four point, almost $5 million before. So I'm saying like DCD put a, a significant amount of funds into this place back in the day. And on top of that, correct, because they needed these temporary schools, they came in in lieu of rent and put in some money that really was state money as well, even though you know, it was in lieu of rent, so it really wasn't grant money. But I'll tell you, the state has just been so instrumental in this place, I can't even tell you. Plus we have three brownfield loans, low interest brownfield loans with DCD. And then the newest champion of, of our project has been CRDA and uh, Mike Freemuth and the, getting that loan for the North Army as a second that brought it over the finish line because the first wasn't gonna, again, just doesn't work. So it wasn't gonna work without CRDA's money. We were able to do that. You get a tax incentive with that. And then uh, we're doing that for U-Shape too. So that's also, even though that's a loan and we will pay it back, it's a low interest loan. It's somewhat subsidized. So the uh, uh, back to the environmental for a minute, we have a question about whether there is any remaining environmental remediation. Sounds like you're done with your environmental re remediation. Do you have monitoring? Do you, are you going to need yes. to be doing monitoring? Yeah. So now we're in the, you know, we've got to do the final report. We actually have to even install a couple more wells. 
we got to do some monitoring after a couple of months in some spots. And then if everything's perfect, you know, so we, we still have a ways to go with the process, but as far as digging or getting an excavator here or capping or putting asphalt or any of that, we're done. We just have to follow the restricted use, continue with our monitoring and do a couple of real expensive reports. Right, right. So at now, who is the owner of the uh, overall property now? Is it, uh, uh, is it a private company that owns the property at the moment? Well, uh, so the ownership is, uh, we've got two ownership entities, two LLCs. One's called Coltsville Redevelopment Company LLC, and one's called Colt Gateway LLC. That was the original LLC for the whole project. Um, and the ownership of that is uh, a partnership between a company that I own called CG Management Company and Chevron TCI. Okay. That's it. There's no other private ownership at all. And there's there's no uh, partnership uh, interest that you've sold. Uh, you haven't gone out to the market and so just on. just between uh, us. Right. We just have the two partners, Chevron TCI and my company that I sold it. Right. So it sounds like when we when we listen to your uh, description of where you're at in the development process, you're pretty close to having this thing fully built out. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I do. What are you going to do with all your free time? <laughs> this place is a never ending challenge because, you know, I even look at some of the commercials. There's always something coming up. Is it going to be at the end of the lease? Correct's leaving us with about 40,000 feet. We'll fit that back out. But there have been some other opportunities that have come up. But, uh, you know, this is my, my love. So I'm just going to stay here for a while, and not worry about anything too much for, because I've got a good year or two of work to do some heavy lifting, finishing this, and then, uh, and I'll certainly be talking to you about the future directly of your company, absolutely, because you've already, as I didn't mention in this, helped me out very much so in the past with my investor partner by uh, truing up some of my numbers, and you, know, you got a great company, and, uh, and I'm going to be coming back to that well, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, there's about 40 people watching this, so I have a feeling that in the next week or so, you're going to, going to get some emails asking whether or not you'd have a look at what they're doing and maybe give them some advice. <laughs> so you could end up being a very busy guy as a result of this webinar. So. Well, it happens quite a bit right now. And, you know, I really do readily give away advice. I just give it I know. Away. So, uh, I and, mean, but you know what? It always comes back in a positive way every single time, every single time. Yeah, I, I share that sentiment with, uh, with you on that. I feel the same way about the, it's a great industry in that regard. People are always uh, willing to share their questions and their answers and their information. It's great. It's sure. a good thing. Um, the uh, COVID, I know you touched a little bit about COVID. Uh, uh, has it had much of an impact on you? So as I indicated, we've been uh, very fortunate in the rent category in that people have not defaulted in any way and uh, companies have been just amazing and uh, creative and also you know you look at the federal government they were part of that too with these loan programs uh, that helped out some of these companies allowed them to continue to pay rent or continue to pay employees uh, so we've been very lucky we haven't one of the effects were more almost personal because you know we really try to I have a I have a pretty tight crew here we I manage the, the property on the ground too I don't outsource anything we do everything in house have the best facility manager uh, I'm not to say his name so he's going to steal him but he's the best facility manager. His name is Rick Flo, he's a great guy. Best facility manager ever. But our crew, what happened was our internal crew uh, ended up getting this. And they all, we immediately got everybody out, which it, so it didn't have great effect on the campus itself. But it was, um, it was tough on me to know, you know, that the guys got this. You yeah. know? And I knew they got it because they're, you know, and some of, some of our people that work for us and the, the maintenance technician people, they have second jobs, they're doing all kinds of stuff. Like, you know, and to know that they're essential workers and that they got it, it was it was a little bit tough just to know that they're, but, but everything turned out fine. Everybody got through it. And, and, and yeah. other than that, that was really our only big like internal negative experience with it. But other than that, not, yeah. not too bad. Uh, we have actually a good question about COVID uh, related to design. Have you uh, changed how you're designing your apartments or any of your spaces uh, as a result of the, the whole COVID pandemic? Sure. So I really did. I, I, and well, you know, it's funny. It wasn't 100 percent. I think it was COVID that did it. But I, I indicated on the U-shape, I got rid of this, any studios and turned mm -hmm. them into dens. 
I turned the studios into dens. So I'd have a one bedroom with a den or a studio with a den, as opposed to just having a studio apartment. So trying to create that separation in space in the apartments, I think it's gonna be important. I have, in the South Army, I have a huge studio coming up. I'm gonna probably partition off a, a piece of that. I think you're gonna see an office space. We just actually signed up Connecticut Innovations. They just finished their space right before they were about to close in. They're, they have a Hartford branch now and they have a New Haven branch. And so they they did their space thinking of COVID very much so. So I'm interested to see what they've done. And I, I'm interested to see what some of our tenants are gonna do with their existing space to maybe make it some way better for this kind of operation through this. What about changes to the, your HVAC system? Anything about how you're doing your HVAC systems now? Are you adding in any, uh, uh, you know, you read a lot about ultraviolet, the use of ultra, ultraviolet light to, uh, uh, to sterilize uh, airborne so they, you know, problems and so on. And also about uh, common areas, are you sort of reducing the number of common areas and so on in your designs? Sure, so uh, on the HVAC thing, uh, my guy Rick, who's a, he's a licensed HVAC guy, and like I say, best facilitator of this stuff that you ever find. But he's, so he he's putting, he put all the special filters in, he's looking at the light technology to see if that's something that's of interest or could actually work or proves out to work. It seems as though it does. Um, a lot of our office space is closed right now or they've got it closed down to most of their people. So they're really keeping a high level of separation which makes up for the ventilation things. One of the things too, is we built a lot of this space out with a very high level of ventilation because schools have a higher level of ventilation requirements in general anyway. So yeah. for instance, our apartments are gonna have ventilation like a school, the one we're building in U-shape because we just have it there already. Okay. As far as the common spaces though, we have had to close some of our community rooms and you know, I'm looking more at, so my thought about this kind of community space, I like more the idea of bringing in like a hooker brewery and having them take care of that common space and they know what they're doing. And as opposed to me trying to do something like you've seen some of the downtown, try to have their own little bar thing that tenants can use. Now, all of a sudden you're trying to, now you need some expertise now to handle this. So yeah. a guy like Kirk Cameron, who's president of Hooker Brewery, this guy knows what he's doing, you know, and he yeah, just takes terrific. great care over there. So same with getting get fit instead of having, I worked out a deal with him where our tenants can work out in his gym and one part of it, as part of our amenity and he'll take care of the gym because he knows how to do it. So in my mind, the amenity spaces are gonna be more like that where I want pros managing this as opposed to me just building a space and say, come use it. Yeah, very good advice. Very good advice as usual. Well, we've reached five o'clock and I think we've covered all the questions. I've been watching the questions as, they, as they've come in. Uh, let me uh, thank you again for your time, well, Larry. This has been great. Uh, uh, appreciate the questions from our listeners. I want to take a minute and thank, uh, thank the uh, GHAR uh, staff, Gina Amicolata and her staff at the uh, Greater Hartford Association of Realtors and also the members of the uh, Commercial Alliance uh, Committee of GHAR. And of course, uh, Larry, I can't thank you enough. It's been great. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.